Check out, come on. We get him. We made it home. Well, it's been another great day fishing. While well, I was out there catching trout after trout, I got to thinking about a lot of the questions we get in fish whispering from our viewers. So this episode is dedicated to you, the fish whispering fan, and we're gonna answer quite a few questions that I often get asked in person and on the Facebook page and email, as well as talk a few details that often happen behind the scenes while we're filming fish whispering. So step inside my shop and let's talk shop. And you'll have a great episode of learning all the things you've been wondering. gear to carry. I don't always have a backpack out with me, but oftentimes I do. Um, sometimes the trips are just longer than others, and I figure if it's going to be more than one bottle of water, I'll take a backpack, because I'll want to take a water filter, worst case scenario. Uh, so you'll see I can carry a lot of extra stuff if I'm going to be a few miles away. Sometimes I'm just, uh, even just like a 20 minute hike from the car isn't too bad and I can stick all I need in just like a shoulder pack or something. But on the longer trips, I'll have a pack, I'll stash that pack, and then I can pull my gear out and I'll have kind of a base camp on the river where I'll walk up and down or around a lake if that's what I'm fishing. And you can see one of the things that I always have with me is my dog, who's so wonderful and only trips me up sometimes. But Caddis Waders has this cool, it's actually a kind of a wading belt hip support system. And when you're in the mountains, you never know when it's gonna rain. Plain and simple. So this little hip strap can fit around here, suck it up nice and tight, and that way it acts as a wading belt. And then if it's gonna rain, pop out your wading jacket slash rain jacket. Throw that on. And you're good to go. Canvas has a lot of cool things I like to bring with me. This is one of the ones I almost always bring with me in case it rains. And the nice thing is, it's also easy to get rid of when the sun comes back out, along with these zip off waders. The best thing about waders that zip down is when you have to pee. Not poop. <laughs> All right. Waders are off and stowed away nicely. And now it's time to get to our questions from our viewers. The first one here is from James in Ashland, Oregon, and uh, he wants to know, Zach, how do you get all of your underwater shots? And well, there's a lot of ways we actually get them, and one is by sending Checo into the river first to find the fish, and after he sees them swim away, then we cry, actually. Uh, just kidding. There are several underwater styles of camera, and we use them all. Uh, we use all your major brands of the point and shoot cameras, but actually my preference lately has been, I just have kind of a point and shoot um, HD camera. They're all 1080 uh, pixels or better, but we'll off often, most time we'll catch a fish, we'll get it in and we'll get as much shots as we can, as much photography as we can before we'll let it go. And a lot of times we'll catch a second fish. And then that one, we'll have that off to the side and we'll have the underwater cameras ready to go and we'll just do a release shot. So a lot of times it looks like I caught one fish, but really I could have caught two to four depending upon the angles of the shots that we want to get. So it does get a little bit interesting in creating that scene. 
and sometimes we're lucky enough to put an underwater camera on a tripod or hide it behind a rock or a willow but we'll shoot a bunch of different angles with them and hope that it comes in and if it doesn't we'll go back and I'll catch more fish and we'll put them into the one shot but it is a great question it does take quite a bit of practice and you got to shoot over and over to make sure it's framed up but the underwater shots are beautiful and it's a great look at the fish's perspective that we enjoy quite a bit in producing fish whispering And here's kind of an interesting one that's really important to outdoor fun and survival. Uh, John Kitzhopper from Portland, Oregon actually wrote and wants to know what's important, Zach, in dressing for the elements on your show? And I really appreciate that question, Mr. Kitzhopper. And the most important thing is to have a good base layer. And I use a lot of breathable fabrics, a lot of synthetics actually against my skin. And then I'll layer up with a synthetic or a wool t-shirt when I can find them. And then from there with like a down vest, sometimes a fleece vest. And then usually in most of your summer months, I'll just have a good heavy rain jacket. And then I'll use my waders, my caddis waders for my rain pants. And with that, I'll throw in a stocking cap, almost always wool, and then at least fleece or wool gloves. Wool is the best insulator when wet. It's a natural fiber, comes from the wonderful sheep. We all love sheep. And uh, it keeps me really warm, even when I'm wet on the river, which I always am in the cold weather. And that layering system usually keeps me well. Sometimes in my dry bag when I'm in a boat, I'll keep uh, a wool sweater handy. And with a wool sweater, I'm pretty good and ready for anything. Pop that hook out, kiss, and release. Bow to thunderstorms, kiss the lady. But they keep coming back because that brown keeps reproducing and getting more and more beautiful every time it flips its tail. Thanks, buddy. Randall from Reno, Nevada wants to know, Zach, why do you kiss fish? And actually, a lot of people ask me why I kiss the fish. Some don't like it. I think it's natural. But it all started when I was seven. I was fishing on a bass pond while my dad was working in the shop nearby and uh, dad took a break, came out, check on, see how I was doing, and I told him I wasn't doing very well. I wasn't hardly catching anything. But as he was taking a few steps back to the shop, I finally hooked up with a bass, reeled it in, took a look at it, and before I put it back into the pond, dad said, oh, you better kiss it for good luck. I kind of looked at him funny, I was like, what? He said, you better kiss it for good luck, so you catch another one. And I'm like, okay. So I kissed the bass and put it back into the pond. And then about three casts later, I catch a crappie. And then a few casts later, a bass and a bunch of crappie after that. It turned out to be a pretty good day, not a crappie day. And uh, ever since then, I've been kissing fish for good luck because my dad told me to. Just gorgeous specimen. Mmm. Mmm. You ever taste fish slime? It actually tastes interesting. Like sweet. Fish slime tastes sweet. If you don't believe me, go kiss a fish. See if I care. Here's one from my good friend Bob Butterworth in Seattle, Washington. And Bob wants to know, how do you find all the beautiful places that you go fishing on Fish Whispering? This is a great looking pond and there's a fish rising. If only you could see what I'm looking at now. <laughs> and while I don't always say exactly where I am, uh, sometimes it's probably better that the places I go are only found by those willing to search for them. And honestly, one of the greatest tools to start with is search them online, but don't read, don't read the angler reports about them. Go back and find fish biologist reports, either from the Forest Service, the State uh, Fish and Game Agency, or some, oftentimes the BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service. 
will have a lot of great scientific information and they will tell you more facts about what they find exactly in size ranges and population densities. And once you find the place you want to go based on your science reports, which is what I use, I still love beat up old topographic maps. You can see these have a lot of detail. Find a third order stream or better and there is likely fish in a third order stream. You, a first order is like a spring, a single blue line. And when a single blue line comes into another single blue line, it's a second order stream. When a stream that has had two blue lines or two tributaries come in, two second order streams have to come together and emerge to make a third order stream. So if you look and you find your third order streams, you're gonna be likely to find a fish and you'll be surprised at how far up in elevation a lot of those streams are and a lot of them can be that wide or even narrower and you'll find fish in them. Those are the places I love to find. I'll use a map and I'll look at it, I'll circle it and I'll say maybe and I'll go there. Sometimes I find fish, sometimes I don't. But there's always a fourth order stream nearby if the third one doesn't. There's exceptions to every rule, but I do nail down a lot of my guesses with the topographic map and biological information online. Well, here's another question from Don outside of Washougal, and he wonders why I can still catch fish with my dog splashing in the water, which he sees often, and fish whispering scenes. And then my wonderful fishing dogs, Ariel and Checo, decided to go for a swim. They're hot, I understand that, but uh, we'll see if whatever's in there, what it is, and if it's still gonna bite. And my dog is in the water as well. That's very helpful, Ariel, thank you. Well, more wild rainbows. Ariel, Ariel, come here, girl. You just about spooked my feeding fish. But when he was a kid, his dad would yell at him for making noise of any time. And he wonders, is that just because my father was sick of hearing me make noise all the time? And Don, it probably is because your father was sick of you making noise all the time. But now that you're a grown man, you can choose to make noise if you would like. Um, and actually, I try to keep Checo's the worst because he loves the water and will run right into it. Checo, come here, bud. So I generally keep him fishing when I'm on larger rivers, and it doesn't matter so much if I'm disturbing the water right in front of me. Hey, while you're out there, why don't you tell me what they're feeding on? Is it the caddis larva, or is it the caddis adult? Is it the caddis pupa? Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. Ariel's usually a lot better than Chetko about staying close, as she likes to chase the mice on the banks. And oftentimes she's up on the hillside anyways, looking after grouse or whatever else. Uh, so I'll take her more often on small stream episodes. But sometimes I'll take both of them, and what I hope is I can keep them close enough, long enough, to catch a fish before they go running into the water. Doesn't always happen that way, but I like traveling with my dogs, and they're always my best buds when I'm out there, even when they spook my fish. There you go. Oh, it's good dog water too, huh? Yes. See, William from Multnomah actually wants to know, Zach, how did you learn so much about habitat and stream health? Which I hope I know quite a bit. It does make a lot of natural sense to me now, but I didn't really learn the very intricate details of it until I started surveying streams for the Forest Service. And it was there I learned that a pair of polarized glasses brown or yellow, not black, is definitely one of your best friends when looking into streams. Um, but honestly, until I started surveying every square centimeter of streams in the National Forest, I didn't learn exactly what fish do with scientific certainty. And the one thing about scientific certainty is, 
doesn't always happen that way, even <laughs> no matter what your percentile of confidence is. But spending time snorkeling, backpack shocking, and walking miles and miles and miles of stream with a stadia rod and a level is the best way to learn about streams. Spend time in water, look at them, and discover all you can without a recreational device, say a fly rod. Here's another question about walking in felt boots. If you ever have walked in felt boots, it usually doesn't take too long to figure out. It is really slippery on grass, but it is really wonderful on rocks. And what I found when I was surveying streams for the Forest Service was every time I'd point my toes down the canyon wall and try to make any progress to the river, I'd almost always slip on my hind end and then I'd get all sorts of scars. I'd show them to you, but this is cable television. So what I found eventually was it's a lot better instead of going straight down the hillside with your feet, it's way better if you turn them at perpendicular 90 degree angle, kind of like if you're walking up a slope and skis, if you kind of tramp them up that way and put your weight on the uphill side of your foot and then walk up or down, you'll find yourself slipping a lot less. But every once in a while you'll still fall down, that's just part of the adventure. And no matter whether you're using rubber or felt sole caddis boots, I do highly, definitely clean them every time you switch drainages to make sure that we remove any kind of possibility of invasive species. Jill from Eugene was wondering what I might do on my hiking trips to help my feet from blisters, uh, which is actually a really good question because it seems like she had kind of a bad experience on one particular trip. But something that I learned quite a while ago was to put tape on the hot spots. So you're walking, preferably in like a medium-ish weight wool sock, so the breeze. Uh, and you'll feel the hot spots usually at the pads of your toes. And so a great thing to do is to take the duct type of tape or some other brand, and but get the, get the good stuff. Do not uh, skimp on your duct tape supply. Peel off just a little bit, and then find your hot and bothered foot, put the tape directly on it while your foot's dry. You will have to take a break to dry all your sweat off. But that'll cushion it enough. And I did this especially in a big horns when we were hiking. I think we hiked about 15 miles in a single day and my feet were killing me. And I stopped and I put some tape on on the way back down and I could hike probably twice as quick to get out of there, which was good because it was after dark when we got back. Here's a pretty good question from Aaron Butler of North Hollywood, California. I like to have those Southerners watching the show. She writes and wonders, were Brad Pitt's techniques real? And also states that she loves Brad Pitt. Well, Aaron, I am happy in your love for Brad Pitt. I apologize for being quite a bit uglier than him. But the shadow casting technique that was actually written about is um, it's a way to cast. So yes, you can definitely cast and whip the line over the water whether the fish think that there's a real hatch emerging or not, we may never know. But what I do know about fish is that generally the more movement you make, the more likely you are to spook them. Uh, so as long as you stay back, um, casting your fly in the air basically just dries your fly out. Uh, but the bunion bugs that they did use and the bamboo rods and the silk lions, those were all real. And the casting was definitely done well by actually Jason Borger, and um, those are real casts, sometimes used, and sometimes they work. And let's see, Blaine from Eugene, Oregon, was wondering, 
kind of what exactly flies I use to fish in the muddy water that I fish every once in a while on Fish Whispering. And which is a really good question. There's a whole bunch of theories out there about the best way to fish off color water. And a lot of people even say you shouldn't fish it, but nothing really stops me from fishing except being dead. Uh, but lacking being dead, what I usually use are fluorescent or super bright colored flies. And actually I have a few in my hat here. Um, like, I mean, this is just a big glow bug. That's a good one for off color. It's just, it's the fluorescent colors reflect a different spectrum. And it does seem to pick up a little bit more notice from the fish. Here's a chartreuse jig. That's a pretty good little one. Um, just bright. It's bright and it bounces and it moves a lot because a large part of fish quote unquote seeing anything is actually them feeling it. And every once in a while I'll talk about the lateral line where they can actually feel every vibration that's around them in the water. And those vibrations can be sound but they can also just be like wave movement. It doesn't make a whole lot of sound to us but the fish feel as much as they see. Um, and that's why you can have sometimes just like big old rubber leggy bugs Boom, those will work great because this one's a little bit darker. It's got some flash though, especially on that bead, a little bit of flash and then just the ability to push water around a fish will get them to hit an off color water. And you've seen this often enough on my Facebook page, but a pink bug, that's all I'm going to get show you for now. But man, this bright pink rubber leggy thing is big enough to push water and it bounces around. So movement, pushing water is as important as having a bright color or on the opposite end you can have a shadow with black but my preference in muddy kind of water is to use brighter colors so that they can actually see a little bit as well as feel the fly bounce around them and then eat it that's my favorite part when they eat it well that about does it for most of the questions that we've been getting lately. Uh, although we do answer quite a few more when you visit us at our Fish Whispering Facebook page. But until then, please send in the questions and enjoy the next Fish Whispering episode. And until then, I have some more flies to get tied because I left most of mine in the willows. Mm -hmm.